All right, so uh, um, I'm, a, I'm not a real doctor, I'm just a faculty member here. Um, and I'll talk, I'm not going to talk about medicine to you because I really don't know much about medicine. Uh, I do know about machine learning. So I'll tell you something which is kind of similar to what Ginger I.O. is doing in, in, in the spirit of it, but uh, we take a, di a very different approach. So I'm going to talk about how you make sense out of sensors. Just the background, so one billion uh, uh, phones, smartphones uh, uh, coming early next year. Uh, always on us, fairly strong uh, computing power, and it's very easy, they're very easy to program. So, uh, the, the, the phones, as a, so I have a phone here, and everything that you ever tell me, unless I'm giving a talk, is always recorded. Uh, so, and I record everything that is happening all the time, and so are quite a few of my students. And uh, the issue here is that in terms of sensors, so we have quite a bit of sensors that we can get, location, communications, uh, um, accelerometer, uh, e-compass, uh, microphone, camera, and quite a few other sensors that uh, you, can, you can get. And recently we also have uh, wearables like heart rate, sweat, uh, and, uh, and uh, body temperature uh, sensors. So all in all, if you look at this huge stream of data that is coming uh, at you, uh, we're talking about between 20 to 200 uh, gigabytes uh, per year. So this is a lot of data. And the point is that we really don't care about this data. I mean, we don't care about uh, the exact values of the sensors. We care about what they mean. And uh, here are examples for some questions that uh, uh, you can ask. For example, you can ask the question about the, the patient getting more or less exercise. You can ask the question about how often, like what kind of typical maximal exercise the patient has been doing, and so forth and so forth. And you can think about all those, uh, all those questions that you would like to ask, and, and preferably if you're a real doctor, you want to ask them using a, um, a natural language. So uh, the issue here, or the reason we need a uh, uh, fairly advanced uh, data analysis tool is that uh, there really is a lot, of, a lot of data and you really need to know just very, very little about it. So we don't really care about the actual values of the sensors. We don't care about the streams. We, we really want to be able to, uh, uh, to summarize the data efficiently and be able to use them later on. And I should also mention that uh, people are different. We want to learn from one user and apply it to others uh, efficiently. So in this talk, I'll, I'll present an approach which uses natural language processing, especially it uses uh, English, and it describes what you have been doing using a natural language. Uh, and we talk about activities, locations, interactions. We summarize all of them into a, a single uh, narrative that describes uh, your day, um, your, your week, your year. And this is quite, uh, it, it facilitates quick uh, and easy retrieval. So later when you want to ask the question that we asked before, uh, you can actually do it. So just a, a, sch a scheme of how it works. So there are the sensors here. Uh, some of them are on the phone. Some of them are, are not on the phone. Uh, and then there is a, the database of a particular user. There is a database of other users. There is a language model. So basically, we create a, a, we use here an algorithmic uh, aspect of using machine learning and machine translation to take all this data, all this information, and convert it into a, a narrative. Uh, of uh, what you have been doing, and then there is a retrieval agent, uh, engine that you can use to retrieve uh, queries that are of interest. So to compare it with the Ginger IO uh, approach, their approach is to create features that then you can correlate with uh, phenomena uh, um, in, in, in the patient. As I said, I'm not a real doctor, so I don't really understand patients. I can understand uh, uh, data and uh, natural language. So uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll give you a few examples. So I'll start with talking about to know what you do. So here the objective is to figure out what you're actually doing, doing. Whether you're walking, running, cycling, or whether you're lingering, whether you're in a meeting, what is the activity that you're currently uh, doing? And I should mention that in data that you can record from people, for example, data that I record, I never type any labels. So there are no labels or hardly any uh, labels whatsoever. And, and this is an example for a tool that we've been using. This is a, a, a fairly neat idea called time delay embedding. So what we see here is the data from an, acceler an accelerometer. So this is the accelerometer data, X, Y, Z um, uh, together combined. So this is quite noisy. So we take this one dimensional signal of X, Y, Z, and then we convert it into a three dimensional signal, which is what you see here. This is a three dimensional mapping. Uh, so this is, a, and this is a, a, something that we, we have been using to detect what activity uh, a person is actually using. So we take uh, the 1D signal and convert it into a 3D um, curve, which you see on, the, on, the, uh, on this side. And then you can ask, well, are people similar? So here are three, four, four uh, persons walking, two males, two females. Uh, one was even wearing heels, 
I guess it was one of the, of the females. And uh, um, basically, you see how, how similar uh, uh, when people walking, uh, uh, how, how similar the walking actually is. And this is another example of uh, four students in the gym. So we, you can see here uh, um, in, uh, in purple, uh, you can see st uh, Stairmaster. In, in a reddish color, you can see rowing. The, the, there are four students, one, two, three, four. Those are their activities, and we just mapped this very high dimensional signal uh, into, uh, into 2D to show you the differences and the similarities uh, between, uh, between the person. So you see that it's fairly easy to, uh, to learn from one user, for example, learn the rowing machine and, uh, and uh, uh, to transfer it to, uh, uh, um, to other, uh, other users. So if we only learned uh, user number one here, we could in principle know quite a bit about user two, three, and four. Um, about what they do, how they do it, and so forth. This is just a two-dimensional embedding of a very high-dimensional signal. And as you see, it's, quite, uh, it's quite, quite strong. And this is an example of biking and running. So we have uh, here, I think, 10 persons on, on, uh, on the left uh, biking. And here uh, you have people, persons running. And you see the clear, uh, this is a stationary bike. Uh, you see the clear and uh, distinct, uh, uh, dis distinct differences. Uh, but some activities are more complex, which are interesting, like dancing or teaching in a class or meetings. But all in all, the atomic activities of walking, standing, uh, lingering, biking, all those activities, driving, uh, are, are fairly easy to detect. And uh, I think we're talking about accuracy uh, upwards of 99% uh, at the moment. I should mention that we also use barometer, accelerometer, and recently we have started playing with uh, heart rate uh, monitors, uh, though they're not, they're not that great. Uh, so we're using all the sensors and we fuse them into, into text. And just to show you how that it, it, it really kind of works, here I just present uh, two signals. This is the accelerometer and, uh, on, the, on black. And in red, you see the barometer. Uh, and this is just, those are just the signals. This is a time in samples. I think it's something like uh, 10 samples every, every second. And, uh, and you see the true label and then the class label that we we'll learn. And, uh, and the accuracy here, this is just a mapping of the activity. So there's lingering which means basically sitting, uh, standing, not doing anything important, going upstairs, downstairs, uh, walking and running. And you see uh, uh, them here. This person is, you know, walks a lot and doesn't run much. Uh, but uh, uh, you see that the accuracy is quite high as uh, the true class label and, uh, and the learned class labels are, uh, are very close to each other. And this is something typical. We've do not done that with many data sets. Uh, you, you don't need a lot of signals to figure out what people are doing. Um, and a little bit more interesting is uh, the issue of, uh, of knowing where people are. So we can know where someone is physically, but that's not something which is really useful. So GPS and IPS, IPS stands for Internal Positioning System, can pretty much tell you uh, uh, where you are. And uh, that's, you know, that's useful, but I'm not sure that my 3D coordinates on the planet is, what really, is real, what, what's really important. Uh, the bigger issue is uh, that location is a subjective concept. So my office can be uh, someone else's uh, uh, work. And uh, uh, the location is something that every person uh, thinks about. Uh, the location is something that is personal uh, to them. Of course, we don't believe that we will be able to do a lot of calibration. And uh, uh, the, the problem here is how can we create or, or understand locations uh, with, um, uh, with, uh, without uh, initial mapping or without initial calibration. So this is an example for a, a work we have been doing. This is a per certain user. And what we see here is trying to learn the user's location just by Wi-Fi mapping. So basically, we, we plug in something on the phone. It records Wi-Fi readings. Uh, and here, every point is, is, a, is a particular Wi-Fi map. So this is sort of what the user is seeing in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Wi-Fi. And every, every, uh, uh, every, every bubble there is a particular uh, distinct location, and the bubbles are connected if, uh, if the user walks between uh, uh, those connections or the, the user transitions from one connection uh, to the other. So we have such graphs. Those graphs are huge. Uh, for me, the graph, uh, um, and which is mostly detected in my house and a few other places, uh, has at least uh, uh, around a thousand, uh, a th a thousand different bubbles. Uh, so there is, those graphs are, are big, and you, you can reuse it, uh, them for many users. And then we, this is uh, the graph with, when we label it, it's so not sure that you see because this is a really large graph. So this is a home, the home of the user. And you, we can even uh, uh, figure out where the kitchen is, where the bedroom is. 
uh, and so forth, where the offices and, uh, and the mappings and, and so forth. So we take those large graphs of, of, of indicators of where use, the user is, in this case Wi-Fi, um, and we create maps that have meanings like home or work or coffee shop uh, and so forth. We also cross color them with a GPS and uh, a GPS uh, uh, location. So uh, one thing what we've been doing is uh, doing this reverse calendar application. Uh, we, we were we participated in the Nokia challenge uh, a, year, a, year, a year and a bit ago, and uh, this is just to give you an example of a fairly small uh, data, uh, data set that we've been using, um, and this data set is completely unlabeled. Uh, so there are, I think, or something like 50 users or so, and about uh, 150 gigs uh, of data, which is, as I said, pretty small. Um, and the idea here is to use uh, machine translation. So there is a difference in, in statistical machine translation, which is what you get when you uh, use Google Translate. Usually there is a one-to-one -one mapping between sentences and, uh, and often between, uh, between words. Uh, this is a little bit more difficult. So uh, the sentences have a very varying length. My, a single sentence can be, I've run for uh, ten, ten, uh, 10 kilometers for 45 minutes. That's going to be a single sentence. Or uh, I've, I've made a phone call uh, and it lasted half a minute. So the sentences can have a very varying uh, length. Uh, there is a lot of verb on the information and uh, there are no labels. So what we have been doing uh, is we are developing a new machine translation methodology for this particular uh, trans translation between large sensors uh, sets and, uh, and uh, English, basically. And we create a new language or different type of senses. Uh, one of the senses that is presented here that is a go sentence. So there's a object, a subject, verb, and, and the times. Uh, uh, we did the, 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 what, the go or the do uh, um, manually, but then we learned verbs from other users and we detected new activities such as shopping, uh, cycling, uh, kayaking, and many other activities that we have uh, uh, labeled and that we currently uh, know what to do. And this is an example for a story of someone whose life is not very interesting. Uh, he just wakes up, goes to work, makes a few phone calls, come back. But this is sort of what the language uh, uh, gives you. And it can give you a lot more uh, as you can drill down into when I said walked. Uh, uh, um, so if here there is a, this person walked uh, uh, to uh, APFL uh, station, you can, uh, in, we can uh, understand, uh, we can provide an uh, adjective to walk, how, uh, how he walked, uh, how fast, and so forth. And just uh, to, uh, uh, to conclude with the outlook, so, uh, there is a whole body of work which I, I'm not uh, going to talk about, uh, which con concerns uh, social interaction uh, using audio and uh, collocation. It's, uh, I mean, it's really interesting that you can understand what you're doing and with whom you're doing it quite easily. Uh, there are issues with privacy, and, uh, and we circumvent the privacy issue by not being a, a company, so nobody is afraid that they're going to steal the data and use it. But uh, also, there is the issue of learning from multiple users, and because we we use uh, the users to, to create the language models, we don't really uh, have their personal, uh, personal uh, information. We just have the information of what they're doing. And then uh, uh, in terms of, uh, it, I think that this line of research opens uh, new avenues for uh, psychological and sociological research. And in terms of mobile health, uh, we've been working uh, on application with, on related to congestive heart failure and management. We're just starting that. And we've worked on, on a post-treatment of, uh, of uh, bone marrow transplant uh, for cancer patients, where we basically try to understand uh, what the cancer patients are, uh, are doing or how well they're doing. And in the future, uh, so there are quite a few other applications where uh, this fine-grained uh, language model can be very helpful. Uh, so thank you for your time. Those are some of my uh, colleagues. Thank you.